afternoon, everybody. This is uh, the Housing Committee, Wednesday, November 28th, 19. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> Let's start over again. <laughs> this is the Housing Committee for the City of Los Angeles, Wednesday, November 28th, 2018, room 1010, City Hall, 3 p.m. I welcome all of you. I'm joined by my colleague, Councilman Krikorian. Uh, Mr. Marquis Harris Dawson is not available for us today. He is out ill, and we look forward to his return. I am Councilmember Gil Cedillo, and as I said, we are in room 1010. We will begin with public comment, general public comment, and cards for multiple items. I see at the top of the list is Herman 666 HHH. Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman is not here. Uh, Jane Dimion, Linda Scott, and Al S. Please come to the table. Okay. Well, I'll call your name in a minute. Uh, Jane Dimion, Linda Scott, Al S. Are you either of those persons? Okay, so you have to sign in. Okay. That's good. I don't see you there yet. I have Susan Hunter. Susan Hunter, are you here? Yes. Please come up. Are you Susan Hunter? Yeah, I, I Mr. Herman, you're already in, sir. You're already in. You're good to go. Uh, you, uh, Miss Hunter, you want to come up? Multiple items. Three and seven. Let's see how we're doing. We can see items. Okay, seven. Okay. Come on up, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Angelinos, good afternoon. Um, based on my determination of city-owned properties, um, I find it an obligation that the city of Los Angeles and Ms. Krikorian need to utilize such development in city-owned property so that we can get the eyesore homelessness of people off our streets. And then we could point our finger at Mayor Eric Garcetti, who created the problem. What's the latest news? Children living in poverty in L.A. What a great story. And that's the legacy of Eric Garcetti forcing children to live in poverty in Los Angeles in the golden state of California. Now, regarding the so-called um, loan losses for the calendar year, we need to stop giving out loans. And we need to start charging interest on loans that don't actively enforce housing stock. And particularly on item number um, eight, compensation not to exceed 125,000. No, it, it should maximize at 150 million dollars, so that this way health management associations can help evaluate the services rendered and needed for people living in poverty. And then on item seven, Terrace Herman Jason Wesson, along with AKA Harris Dawson, uh, rent stabilization, well, it's not gonna happen. We all know that Mr. Wesson with Eric Garcetti and the Chinese developers are accusing Jose Weizar of all the abuse of development. But we have to point our finger back to the mayor who behind closed doors, on numerous trips across the states within our golden state, was using campaign money to promote his presidency. 
But as you see, we don't want a failure mayor like Eric Garcetti churning out children in poverty. Do you still want to walk around and see homeless people on your street in the next 20 years? Then just like I said, there is no rent stabilization and we might as well just pass out nothing. Simply nothing. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Dio. Thank you. Keep up the hard work. I have items uh, one, two, four, five, and eight without speakers. We can move those as consent. No objection, Mr. Chairman. No objection. Let that be the record of the day. Let me call up item. Item three. Item three. Item number three is CIDLA report relative to the implementation of systematic code enforcement program, tiered inspection regulations developed pursuant to Los Angeles Municipal Code 161.602B. We can go back and do that. Did you want to do this right now? We could. I don't want to reconsider it. Okay, before we move on, uh, and before the record gets uh, established, for item one, we, the CAO requested a technical change, and we wanted to make sure that the um, that the CAO and the clerk uh, had submitted changes. Uh, if the changes had been submitted by the CAO, can we embrace that, or do we need a reconsideration? Um, no, we can include that right now. Okay. So right. number one will be approved as amended. Thank you. Uh, item three. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Uh, what you have before you is a request for approval of a regulation for creating a tiered inspection program. But before I discuss that, I'd like to give a little background of the Housing Department's systematic code enforcement program, uh, with your permission. Um, the systematic code enforcement program was established in about 1998. And in that time, it grew from about 15 inspectors to over 96 inspectors today, together with a chain of command of three chief inspectors and eight principal inspectors. Its primary mission is to maintain habitability in rental properties. That's rental properties where there's two or more dwelling units on a lot. And the program's been successful from that time. In about 2005, it was rec recognized by Harvard for an Excellence in Government Award. And um, today, it continues to do that. And what we have found is that because of the work of the program, 95% of the properties have come into compliance with the orders that the department issues. 5% are non-compliant. That leads to the tiered inspection program. The purpose of the regulation is to focus our resources on that 5% by creating a tiered program through, through which they're inspected once every two years instead of once every four years under the current regulation. Uh, my colleagues are here and they can explain the uh, details of the tiered program if you would like. Thank you, uh, Director Gomez. Uh, Robert Gallardi, Chief Inspector, Code Enforcement, um, the architect of what we refer to as the re reliable information to score effectively RISE. It's RISE that is the foundation for the system we're setting forth here this afternoon. The RISE score is developed to identify properties based on our cycles of inspection and the events that occurred during that cycle of inspection. Our cycles of inspection over the past uh, nearly 20 years or approximately every four years. It takes us four years to inspect over 750,000 rental units, which represent over 100,000 properties citywide. <clears throat> so what we do with this, with this regulation is we're going to look back at our last cycle. That's the cycle we're currently finishing. It started in um, late uh, July 2014. It's going to conclude in uh, this, the end of this calendar year. So one of the things that I wanted to make a point of prior to even talking about the rise is the, the state of our housing stock today. Looking back at all of our previous four cycles of inspection, as Director Gomez presented to you, we have a very good compliance rate with our property owners in the city, nearly 96%. 
Um, one important fact that you should recognize as the council members here this afternoon is that you should know that approximately one third or 25 percent of our property owners in this city don't even get an order during our cycle of inspection. About 66% to 70% of our property owners receive an order. So it's things, it's the property owners that received an order um, that lead to the regulations here today. Um, we're defining our tier inspection into two tiers, tier one, tier two. Uh, if you look at the, um, the regulations set forth before you this morning or this afternoon, it's a very simple system. All the property owners start off with a base score of 10. And looking back at our cycle of inspection, we start pro uh, property owners, wouldn't call it earn it, but they're given demerits. And those demerits are set forth before you today. One, uh, I'm just gonna go quickly through the demerit system. Um, the first demerit that the property owner could receive is that it took them longer than 120 days to comply with our order. So they get a demerit of one. Um, the next demerit system or uh, method is um, the average number of violations per unit. <clears throat> so we calculate, looking back at the events, how many violations were per unit on the order issued if they received an order, and they, get a, they also get a demerit. Moving on to the next demerit, it's whether or not the case needed to be referred to our enforcement section. So our systematic day-by-day day inspectors go out there, issue orders, go back for re-inspections, and those prop properties that do not comply in a timely manner are referred to a specialized group of senior inspectors. Those senior inspectors are, are known as our enforcement section. So if they do not comply timely, they get a demerit of minus one. Moving on to the Remaining demerits, um, if the property owner doesn't comply in a timely manner and we're um, by ordinance ref have to refer that property owner to a general manager's hearing, there's a potential for another demerit. And then we try to incorporate on top of our systematic inspections the complaint component. We do do complaint inspections. So if a property owner during that cycle or period of time receives three or more orders on a complaint, they also are provided a demerit. And then last but not least, if the property conditions uh, are such that a, an inspector issues a substandard order, that's our most, uh, our strictest order, um, they get an automatic demerit of minus four. <clears throat> so what we do is we combine all the data for those inspections, we add up all the demerits in that given time frame for, for moving into cycle five starting January 2019, we're gonna be looking back at all the inspections that occurred from July of 14 up until um, January of uh, eight, uh, excuse me, January 1st of 2019. So when we apply those rules, those demerit factors to the, those properties, we've set the baseline at the, the score at, mine at six. So if you had four or more demerits based on our events in the previous cycle, you are determined to be a tier two property. Those tier two properties, looking back historically at the cycles, was running roughly from 5%, 4%, 3%. We project in 2019 that we will have at least 2% to 3% tier two properties. Those properties will be inspected twice in the cycle, every two years, compared to the tier one, which will benefit from a inspection once in that four-year cycle. Currently, the number is going to be about, looking at the data, we have about 2,000 properties. Those, we project 2,000 properties will be inspected every two years over the next four years, and those properties, um, once they, looking forward in time, once those properties start um, maintaining their buildings, and not uh, postponing or delaying the uh, compliance rate could eventually in cycle six move out of tier two. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have regarding how our system works. It was originally envisioned. It's once again, it's known as reliable informational score effectively. The acronym is RISE. We originally developed it just for mapping we wanted to get a picture of the city, the status of the city, the status of our rental neighborhoods, 
and we, we have been utilizing it for mapping. Now we're taking it to the next step. We're identifying specifically the property and we're going to inspect it uh, more routinely to ensure that those properties which struggle on maintaining their uh, properties are brought up to speed. It's important to note that it's important to notice in this that uh, the users bear the cost. There's a reinspection fee for this, so there's nothing new about that. Questions? I think this is a you know really good initiative to focus resources where they're going to be most effective and um, focusing more on the properties that have been problematic is important. Um, and it sounds like you've done a lot of the, um, a lot of this analysis, but do, how confident are you in sort of the workload indicators of this to know that you're going to have, with, with this shift in focus, that you will have adequate resources to be able to maintain an appropriate inspection cycle of four years or two years? Um, because this is going to shift it's going to shift the workload, um, and maybe it'll shift, maybe it'll be a zero-sum game, or maybe it won't, but I, I just want to make sure you're going to have the resources you need to be able to implement this. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing that up, uh, Councilman. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits to the tiered system was that when we recently amended the housing code at the end of 2016, we actually moved the statute from three years to four years. That gave us a little bit more wiggle room with the caveat that we go to this tier system in our next cycle. So looking at the numbers, his, just if we even use 2,000 properties, um, we could accommodate that. It's not a really large impact when you talk about <clears throat> we inspect 25,000 properties a year, okay? So we take the 1,000, we sprinkle 1,000 over 12 months. We, it's, it's, it'll, be, it'll be completed without additional resources, Council. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Good. Okay, before we move on, let's hear from Susan Hunter and Wayne. Thank you. Susan Hunter, Los Angeles Tenants Union Hollywood local caseworker. Uh, unfortunately for the Los Angeles Tenants Union, the majority of the properties that we deal with are the properties that we're hearing about today, where there are continued uh, violations uh, that are consistently appearing on the property. Uh, buildings that have been in REAP, that came out of REAP, and still, uh, you know, six months or a year go by, and then there's problems again that are not being addressed. Uh, so it's kind of shocking for some of us when we walk into a building and we see that there are code violations that have been present for years. Tenants don't know what code violations are, and unfortunately, because they'll complain to managers over and over again, they learn to live with it because they're also scared that if they complain that they're going to lose their housing. So it's on the city, I think, in a way to, we try to do that every four years. I don't think it's working. And knowing that we have a position where we can send people in uh, every two years to make sure that people aren't learning how to live with these horrible conditions is only going to benefit the people that are paying the taxes. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, so this is uh, something on behalf of uh, the property owners. Uh, we're thoroughly uh, opposed to this because now that Jose Weizar has been raided by the FBI, we have to change a few things on this motion. First... Let's eliminate the need to pay off the building inspectors. I, I, the time has come, and I know all of you out there that own properties, I know you're scared, but come, come into the light. Come forward. No longer will you have to pay off the building and safety department and pay off the building inspectors. And I, I congratulate uh, Gil Cedillo for doing that. That's, uh, that's, uh, that. Because I'll tell you, you, Gil has been quietly working on this for six years. That's why they ran that jack off uh, Joe Briali, the bicycle boy, against him, because he wanted to stop this crap. Just let the building inspector do its job. No more payoffs. Oh, and also. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. That uh, concludes public comment on uh, the item. Uh, motion to adopt the recommendation in the H said report. So moved. so moved, and so be the order. Item. 
Item six. Number six, discussion item, CLA and ACIDLA to provide an update in regard to propositions one, two, ten, and related policy matters. Good afternoon, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, so this is a report on legislative um, action related to housing issues. And so just the real brief, um, there are two parts here. First, we, we just had an election with uh, three items that related to how that were related to housing that were uh, before the voters. And then um, beginning in, in January, the process of the, the legislature coming back to work, a new legislature, new legislation will be coming forward. And um, so we wanted to give you a briefing on where we stand with that. So the first, um, the absolute latest results we have um, as of noon today from the state uh, uh, is that um, measure one, the, um, the uh, bonds to fund veteran and affordable housing is uh, has had passed with a vote of 56% yes and 44% no that needed um, just a simple majority so that's 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 passed um, the uh, measure two amend existing housing program for mental illness that passed with a, a vote of 63.2% and no 36.8% uh, um, the other measure of concern was uh, measure 10, rent control on residential property, and that one did fail. That was a no vote of 40.4% and a, no, a yes vote of 40.4% and a no vote of 59.6%. Um, so the, the, the first two measures, uh, measure one and measure two, will actually provide up to $5 billion in um, funding for affordable housing in the state of California. The um, three billion in the um, in Measure One um, will basically flow through many of the existing HCD programs. The two two billion in the um, mental health illness program that's actually going to a program called No Place Like Home, and that money will actually flow through the county um, rather than to cities directly. And so, um, hopefully, um, I think all of the work that HCD has been doing with the county recently. It has, will be very helpful in guiding um, that funding toward the city of Los Angeles. So uh, that's the um, the quick rundown on the ballot measures. I don't know if Rush has any more details he'd like. Uh, just put a little more meat on the bones. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members Rushmore Cervantes. On Proposition One, uh, the uh, the monies will flow into eight existing state programs. Uh, the lion's share or the highest percentage of resources will go into the uh, multifamily housing program to fund, as it states, multifamily housing production. And uh, historically in the past, it has also been utilized to fund supportive housing. Uh, though of the, of the allocation or the bond measure, it'll, it'll receive $1.5 billion. And we've been working closely with the state. We anticipate that they're going to release uh, a NOFA or call for projects probably sometime in the early spring with regulations still to come. And of course, we will be at the table looking to uh, discuss best ways to be able to bring resources here to the local level. The intent, though, to have the first call go out uh, preceding uh, the updated regulations is because they want to get the money out as quickly as possible. The state Legislators understand the need to get this, these resources out to the local level, so they're going to do this call relatively quickly in the eight existing programs, and then there could be some tweaks down the line with the new regulations that, of course, will be at the table to discuss. Uh, based on historic perspective, Prop 1C, we would imagine this, this will probably be a five- to seven-year program. It could accelerate based on the overall demand. Under Prop 2, the $2 billion, as John indicated, it's uh, basically... Uh, they're utilizing state mental health service act dollars to basically service that debt with that though comes the same level of of uh, requirements for the constituents there must be severe uh, mental health issues uh, for constituents and that's how we'll tap into those resources for our hhh funds we've been working with the county since uh, 
2016 as this was being contemplated. As a matter of fact, we just had a meeting earlier today with the county representatives for both mental health as well as the, the Community Development Commission as we looked to, uh, to determine how best to allocate those resources not only within the county but specifically within the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the first tranche of the close to $700 million that the county is going to receive uh, will be approximately $230 million and they anticipate doing a call for projects in March uh, with the awards being made in June. And of course we're going to work very closely with them to try to identify those properties or projects that are in our pipeline now for HHH that we can uh, obviously augment our, our commitment, our taxpayers have committed to, as well as these new obligations that, uh, that are coming from the state. So uh, we're also at the same time in a parallel track, we're developing a you know, universal application system that w the developers will be able to uh, upload their applications one time so that it'll be applicable not only to HCID, but it'll also be applicable to um, HACLA for the vouchers as well as the county for uh, various funding sources. So it'll be a one-stop shop for them to make it easier for them. And come the next round for the uh, Prop 2 dollars that will be in play. And by and large, it'll, it'll expedite the approval process significantly and get more product on the street more quickly. And then lastly, as far as Prop 10, John indicated that uh, uh, that went down. Of course, that would have repealed Costa Hawkins. And I think it's important to note that um, the uh, the amount of resources that were were raised to be able to fight that uh, and the extent of which where they were fundraising it was across the country to, to defeat that uh, but um, what we've heard though is is that withstanding the fact that it was defeated soundly that uh, there is uh, understanding from people on both sides of the uh, discussion uh, and the ballot that uh, this isn't the last time we're going to see this there's already discussions about potentially it coming back in 2020 maybe some variation of that, but there's obviously a cry for some change. To that end, HCID in the new uh, calendar year will commence a series of community uh, outreach meetings uh, to discuss post-10. Where are we now? Where do we need to go with the rent stabilization ordinance in the city of Los Angeles? What kind of recommendations can we glean from multiple different stakeholders, not just landlords and tenants, but across the board from an economic viewpoint as well, and come back with those series of discussions, come back with potential recommendations for future consideration from the, the council? Um, the, the legislature has the ability to change Costa Hawkins, and so we do expect to see legislation um, in the coming year that will make that effort, uh, your, your HCID and CLA staff will monitor that legislation and let you know as soon as we see um, issues that come forward that would be helpful to the city. Mr. Coyne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of things on, on Prop 1 and 2. Um, first of all, what do we anticipate to be LA's share of the anticipated revenues uh, from those, if you will. And um, Rush, to your point on um, having a sort of expedited call process, um, since both of these are funding existing programs, is there any way that, I mean, what they're essentially doing is, doing is expanding the pie that was previously cut up for these programs. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, is there, could there not be a process by which um, projects previously submitted in mm -hmm. previous calls that were denied because there wasn't adequate funding to mm -hmm. go around could now be resuscitated on a more expedited basis than waiting until March, doing another right. call, having mm -hmm. a decision made by June, mm -hmm. having, yeah, all of this is, becomes years of delay because you know there's no funding in place and then mm -hmm. the developer can't move forward with their plans. and. Uh, I just, is there not some way that we can fast track some of this based on previous projects that we've submitted and, mm -hmm. and would they accept that? Well, let me speak to the two, two first because the county has control over how they're going to allocate those resources. And unlike prior programs, Councilman, uh, they are looking to do a threshold review, much like we do with HHH now. And we're talking uh, extensively about aligning our review of projects as they come in to ensure that it's not the same scrutiny that they were previously up but for the time when we're ready to close. Uh, the county is potentially interested in looking at projects that were previously approved for HHH as well as those that are in our, 
our uh, conditional letter of commitment bucket, wherein we've committed but haven't necessarily sold bonds without obviously supplanting. That's a concern that the county would have, but the, the counter to that we convey to them, we'll continue to convey to them, is, is that by utilizing HHH dollars, even though they may have been previously committed, they have not started construction, utilizing HHH coupled with No Place Like Home enables a, a, a blending of the resources and leveraging the resources and enabling both pots of money to be extended further. So there's a, there's a definite interest on their part not only to see the blend, but also to expedite. So I, at least on two and the county, we, we, again, we've been working with them for two years. We are very much on the same page as to how to get the dollars out quicker and with not necessarily the same level of scrutiny, but more on the threshold review and then the bottom line when ready hit send. We, we've all made the similar commitments just like we do with the Housing Authority. The As important thing to note is that the, the Measure 2 money is directed toward a specific population, and Los Angeles County has a large portion of that population in the state. Mm -hmm. So if that money is to be used, the county is going to need to find projects that qualify, and the Housing Department has a lot of those projects. Yeah. Yeah, so we just need to line our work up yeah. so that we can get in there effectively and, and apply for it. Yeah, this speaks to your, your question about getting our fair share. Uh, the City of Los Angeles has made a major commitment, and the only way those dollars are allocated are based on construction projects that are going to serve that, that cohort. And, as, and obviously, with the number of projects we have in our queue right now for HHH, we will certainly fare very well on that front. As it relates to Prop 1 in the state, that's going to take further discussion as they roll out, roll out their uh, regulations for uh, comment. And we'll have to, as a city family, ensure that we do our due diligence to make sure that we're getting our fair share here at the local level. And that's, that's, that's an ongoing concern. At, at, at this point, we're not aware of any specific nuances or changes they're going to be making, but that's still forthcoming. Again, the, I'm, we're pleased the fact that they're willing to at least do an, uh, call her projects now or relatively soon and then uh, on a parallel track look to uh, release their regulations for public comment and of course we'll be discussing that with this committee to ensure that uh, you're in the, in the loop as far as how perhaps we uh, as a body can, can lobby for our, you know, the city of Los Angeles. Well, yeah, and just in terms of expediting you know, our participation, yes. it, it, we, I assume we have a long, long queue of unfunded potential projects that could be funded through Prop 1 now that we're ready to go with today. Right. And is, there's not going to be any delay in that, mm -hmm. whatever delay is going to be on the state. Right. And both the county and the city made a conscious decision with its resources to, if you will, enhance the per unit subsidy while we were waiting for these pots of money to become available. So everyone was in a position to try to uh, wait for these dollars. So now that they are here, everyone's anxious to start spending them immediately. So, I mean, I would say, Councilman, the rhetoric and the conversation, the dialogue we've had uh, have been really resounding. We need to get the dollars out fast and, and a, a sense of collaboration that we've not seen. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before we move uh, this item, Mr. Spindler, please join us. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, if if you did, you want also a rundown of the legislative proposals that will be moving forward in the next year. Dora is available to give you a quick rundown of those eight items. Yes, before, if you don't mind, Mr. Spindler. Yes. Yeah, so, you two need to go. We're going to finish. Uh, their report was not complete. Then. Oh, really? I'm oh, okay. Here. I apologize. Okay. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Dora Huerta with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, our office reviewed uh, some proposals from the Housing and Community Investment Department and prepared a report that went through Rules Committee and was approved by Rules on November 16th. I'll give a short overview of the, four, of the proposals that we, our office is recommending um, that the city support. Uh, we have three uh, federal proposals, uh, including uh, the reform of low-income housing tax credits, um, affirmative affirmatively furthering fair housing rule and the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, but I'll begin with the state uh, proposals. Um, Ellis Act reform, which allows um, landlords who would like to exit the rental business to remove his or her unit from the market. Um, that was the original intent of this act. However, it's been reported that, that some landlords will um, evict tenants and then sit out the waiting period and then re-rent the units. So our office is recommending uh, support for any bill that would strengthen the tenant protections um, after uh, properties have been ellised. 
Um, second, uh, the collection of eviction data from superior courts. Uh, currently, there are challenges in collecting this data um, as housing has, has tried and reached out to collect this information as they shape um, different legal defense programs, including one that the council recently um, authorized or instructed different departments to move forward with. Um, so our office recommends um, any bill that would mandate superior courts share this information with housing entities. Um, redevelopment financing tools. So with the elimination of the redevelopment agency in 2012, um, several TIF uh, tools have been introduced. Um, however, they're very different than the old uh, redevelopment agency, including um, some of the major uh, changes are the agencies that can contribute to a TIF and different housing-related requirements. So our office uh, recommends that we support any bill that uh, would bring back redevelopment to support these types of programs, including affordable housing and economic development. Article 34, uh, reform or repeal. Um, as a result of a 1950 change to the California Constitution, um, different uh, local jurisdictions need to submit uh, for voter approval projects that would be funded uh, with public funds. Um, the city has received authority to finance up to 52,000 units um, and has a cap of 3,500 units per council district. And the city is close and Certain council districts, more so than others, are close to reaching their ceiling. Um, at the same time, as John just indicated, and Rushmore and Mr. Cervantes, um, the state voters have approved you know, over $6 billion in funding for affordable housing closer to home. The city has approved, or the city voters have approved $1.2 billion to fund permanent supportive housing. Um, we feel it's the voters' intent to move forward with this housing, and we think it's um, adequate and appropriate to recommend legislation that would amend Article 34 or repeal it. As far as the federal um, proposals, uh, low-income housing tax credit um, reform is important to expand the program. This is a very critical tool for funding affordable housing. Commonly, uh, many people know these programs as 4% and 9% tax credits. So we're looking to um, support a program or a bill that would enhance uh, tax credit reform. Um, affirmatively furthering fair housing role. This is the HUD rule instituted to, uh, to understand what the landscape is out there in terms of uh, fairness in affordable housing. Um, the rule requires uh, an assessment of fair housing uh, by grantees, uh, cities and localities that have received HUD, HUD financing. Um, currently, uh, HUD has delayed its approval of these uh, AFHs that cities have submitted, including our own city, um, and they've delayed implementing this rule. So we would um, support any bill that would preserve this rule. Um, the National Housing Trust Fund, um, there are reports out there that there may be a wind down at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two entities that support the National Housing Trust Fund. That is a new federal source of funds to support affordable housing. We would uh, recommend any bill that would preserve this um, trust fund uh, as a much needed source to fund housing for the city's most vulnerable populations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Corian. Let me note that uh, in terms of the legislation with the, the redevelopment agencies, I know there's a push to uh, refund them and put them back in place. Uh, one of the observations is that there's a well, the funding was removed, the rules were left in place. And so it's encumbrances on various uh, development plans. And so if the dollars aren't going to be there, then those rules need to be uh, eradicated. They're not, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an encumbrance on uh, development and there's no need for the rules if there's no funding for, for them. And so um, uh, let me suggest that we uh, amend our program with, with that uh, part of the proposal. Okay. Good. Mr. Spindler, thank you. So it basically happens. You have to look at the Wells Fargo case that the FBI went ahead and indicted. And what happened was you get tax credits, the higher per unit cost on a project. That's what all these people are around Jose Weezer are about. That's why they're fucking raiding his office, because 
they're looking for this scheme and what it is and all these projects you guys don't go to HHH committees There's, they're, what they do is they submit the projects they keep increasing the, the per cost per unit and delaying every year you delay it you can tack on seven to eight percent cost increases now that's what we don't get to talk about because Herb Wesson's in the morning. Stay on the topic, stay on the topic. But suffice it to say, um, I would stay away from these projects if any of the developers, I'd stay away from this tax money for at least the next three years because those AWEs are fucked this whole thing up for everybody. He's a fucking asshole. Yeah. Finally. Seven? Seven. Was that Ms. Hunter? Okay. Number seven, motion O'Farrell, Wesson, Cedillo, Bonin, Harris, Dawson, and Price relative to evaluating the rent stabilization ordinance and related matters. So Ms. Hunter, Lisa Scott, Jane Dimian, Al S. Is that you, Ms. Hunter? Uh, Lisa Scott? And Mr. Spindler, please join us. Susan Hunter, Los Angeles Tenants Union, Hollywood local caseworker. Uh, I'm here today. Uh, if we are talking about ways that we can expand our RSO housing stock, one of the problems that we're seeing is that on properties where the RSO has been removed, either for luxury exemption, major renovation exemption, uh, affordable housing, we need to have a process where we can reinstate that RSO once that justification is no, no longer there. So we have properties who are exempted either through luxury exemption or major renovation exemption uh, from 1987. And those properties have fallen into dilapidation. And there are major code violations on the property. One property, the garage was actually condemned because it was literally falling in on itself. So I don't understand how somebody's saying I have to have more money in order to invest in upkeep my luxury property. <clears throat> if they're not putting the money back in, why they get to be RSO exempt? So this is a property built and occupied prior to 1978, and those tenants need to have those protections put back in place. And we have to have a process in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Jane? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm Jane Demion. I'm a um, Assembly District 51 delegate. I campaigned for Prop 10, and I also supported AB 1506 uh, to repeal Costa Hawkins. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to expand our RSO in Los Angeles, which is frozen at 1978. Um, I appreciate the motion that was proposed by the council members in relation to this item. Uh, the problem is there is no uh, end time for when the evaluation period is going to take place. And I, I don't want this to continue to go on for two or three years. We have a very critical situation in the city. We need to have these decisions made immediately. So I would say, if anything, maybe we could do like a three-month evaluation or maybe a six-month evaluation with a, an eviction moratorium and a rent freeze throughout the city to allow renters to be able to, to catch up with their lives and not be evicted and not have rent increases, throw them out on the street. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott. Um, I'm here today in support of this motion. Uh, I live at 7057 Lanewood Avenue, and I've lived there for 20 years, and it's my home. And four months ago, the building was sold, and two months later, the expected rent increase came, and mine was $1,300 a month. Um, let me be clear, I have to now come up with $1,300 more a month, and I don't think I can do it. I'm trying, but I don't think I can continue to do it. So I have savings for December, and I'm going to stay, but I have to leave, and I have to find somewhere else to live, which is not what I want to do. So I'm here today in support of this motion, begging you to do something. It's too late for me. I have no more options at, at my home, this current home, but I have to move to somewhere else, and there's others who are going to be affected every day and, and are. So please, please do something. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Bauer? Hi. 
Um, I'm in a similar situation and uh, living in a building that was built in 1927, which should qualify for RSO, but was exempted under a luxury exemption. Um, it may have been luxury units in 1977, but that is no longer the case. We're looking at pretty spectacular um, repair issues and you know, structural problems, plumbing problems that are hard to pin down. And uh, our rent has been raised 40% in the last four months. This is home of seven years. Um, I don't believe that the luxury exemption, the intent of a luxury exemption is being accurately reflected in the situation where I live. And for that reason, I think it's important to provide a mechanism to re-examine whether or not that exemption should be in place at all. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I, I like the luxury exemption, um, but I think we should move it far up above. Now, you got to remember, Armando Herman, the great critic, lost his rent control department because of Jose Weizar and going to the cops. Because, see, a lot of these people lose their rent control. They fake an arrest. They call 911. They say there's a disturbance. They arrest you. Now they can throw you out of the apartment because you have a criminal record. That's what a lot of these landlords used to do when Jose Weizar was in charge. That's another way. Another way, in Mr. Kikorian's district, uh, his developer went ahead and had somebody shoot out the windows in a project at Studio City to get rid of that tenant. Right, Paul? Of course. See, he, he don't want to look. He doesn't want to look and see the fact that he let his developer shoot the windows out of a place to get somebody out of rent control. So we know the games you play. So does the FBI. Thank you. Mr. Kikorian? Move the item. The item is uh, being moved to receive and file in the context of the failure of Prop 10. That is the motion. Mr. Mr. Cervantes, you want to comment on this uh, in terms of the impact of Prop 10 on, on uh, this motion? Ah, hey. Good afternoon, Councilman Anna Ortega, Director of Rent Stabilization. Um, this motion basically called for an evaluation of the RSO and how we might expand tenant protections. Um, it was made before the election um, that we just discussed about Proposition 10. And bef you know, before that was determined, various rent control jurisdictions were looking at, well, if, if Proposition 10 passed, how would we be expanding the RSO, the timeframes uh, under which units qualify to be under the RSO? Now that's kind of moot, but I'll just mention that uh, Prop 10 was really about the appeal of Costa Hawkins, and Costa Hawkins is all about controlling rents. So just because it failed as far as expanding controls on rent, that doesn't mean that jurisdictions are precluded from expanding other protections. And in fact, in the city of Los Angeles, we've expanded protections for RSO units many times over the past few years and many times recently. Just a few of them are we adopted an enhanced tenant assistance program we looked at the, as you recall, the mandatory retrofit ordinance and how that was passed through. That was in 2015 and 16. We uh, adopted the rent registry late in 2016, and we've just completed the first mandatory year of the rent registry. The city adopted its cash for keys program in January of 2017. We did Ellis amendments that went through this committee, two sets in, in 2017. One went into effect in April and the second set went into effect last December. Um, we also adopt the city, it actually is rather unique in the protections that we've applied to foreclosed properties. So we've expanded for uh, eviction protections to non-RSO units that are foreclosed upon. And that was first adopted in 
2008, and it's been uh, extended numerous times, so it's currently in effect through 2020. We have a number of other um, uh, proposals and recommendations that we're working and will be reporting on to this committee in the next few months. We're looking at an anti-tenant harassment ordinance. We're looking at uh, just cause for all units, including non-RSO units. Um, we're working on a report on a tenant right to counsel. And of course, this committee has recently heard the proposed um, ordinance about home sharing. All of these are protections, expanded protections, related to renter, uh, renter protections that are beyond the scope of Costa Hawkins and are within the city's ability to adopt. So there's a lot coming to, to this committee and to the city council in the next few months as far as expanding tenant protections. Yes, Mr. Kikorian. Mr. Chairman, in light of those comments, um, I wonder if you might think it appropriate that in, rather than receiving and filing, if we had go ahead and advance this motion forward, because it calls for not only um, examining options to adjust the RSO, but it also calls for recommendations to offset the reduction in rent-stabilized housing. So it is a little bit broader in scope, I think, than just things that might have been constrained otherwise by Costa Hawkins. And, and I mean, we just heard a number of examples of ways that we have taken in the past right. to try to expand affordability. And I think there's a place for having a motion move forward to, yep. to explore that. So uh, I agree. Uh, also, you heard the comments from the audience, and so I think those should be uh, taken as uh, proposals and suggestions for us to develop policy from that. So, for example, this, these questions of uh, luxury housing exemptions, an inventory and a reevaluation uh, on the impact. Uh, I think in some instances uh, there's facts and then there's facts. When you look at the numbers uh, in terms of units lost uh, over long periods of time, what are those numbers? What does that mean? Um, I think it's important to to have a, a critical uh, analysis of where we're at and how we need to go forward. And so I, I agree with you, and I think that's permitted within the range of this proposal. And I'd be because I'm uh, this uh, the the um, luxury exemption, for example, and having a look back at the luxury exemption after some number of years or after the rental rate for such so-called luxury property falls below the median. Or, or I don't know whether any of that would actually be permitted under Costa Hawkins or not, whether we could look at those sorts of things. It, so I, I think it would be appropriate to try to find some recommendations that within the context of the law as, as it stands right now, what, what steps could we be taking. So. I think it's important. Okay. All right. So we'll. So we will approve the motion then, sir. Yep. Very right. good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Does that clear our file? That is all. Clears the desk. Clears the desk. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So be the order. Thank you.